If you are just joining this room for the first time this afternoon, um, I've uh, invented a new, um, a new uh, thing we're going to do where we're going to give a standing ovation to all this afternoon's presenters for all their hard work in coming here to speak to you. So our next um, speaker is Ben Hirschberg. And so if you could please be up standing and give a standing ovation for Ben. But you haven't heard of my presentation yet, so at the end, please. Okay. Um, so, hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, this is not my computer. Don't. So, sorry, I had some problems with my computer. I left it at the airplane, so I'm using not my computer right now. But hopefully the presentation is going to be okay. So, uh, just a few words about me. It's not that interesting, and we don't have, have a lot of time. I'm Ben. Uh, CTO of Armo, cloud native security company, uh, maintainer of Cubescape, and contributor to different other CNCF projects. Uh, also, like all around uh, here and there. Uh, I really thought how to start this presentation today, and uh, you know we are going to talk about eBPF. I hope it is not a surprise for you after reading the title. Um, <laughs> But like, you know, there are all these presentations where, you know, eBPF is the medicine for everything and eBPF you know, solves your, all of your problems. And I wanted to start with this and then I said, well, I want to start with something which is more, more pra practical. How do we solve problems? And, um, and I got to the security problem of, of configuring uh, uh, things around Kubernetes clusters um, properly in a secure way and how usually sometimes lack of knowledge is what, how applications are behaving are a problem, of, uh, problem and how we can use observability to solve this problem. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, how we're going to uh, implement, uh, uh, how we're going to improve our Kubernetes workload security by looking at uh, observability data from eBPF. Uh, we'll see how we are going to generate network policies based on eBPF behavior uh, analysis, how we are going to generate second policies, and, at the, uh, and we'll also talk a few minutes about how to handle vulnerabilities. But in general, the whole idea, whole philosophy of the, the, today's discussion is how we can use deep observability in order to do our work better, things that seem to be very hard and very time com confusing, how we make take two data streams together and make sense of it much better than before with it. So uh, I hope at this conference this is not a surprise, least privilege principle as from a security perspective. Uh, so least privilege is the idea that we are giving to every actor the privilege it, it exactly it needs to com uh, complete his job and nothing more. And this is what we are, we are trying to achieve when configuring workloads. So, as we, uh, as we are continuing, again, I'm returning, we are going to talk about work, workload configurations, pods, network policies, second policies. The idea is that while we're working in, this envi in these environments, we are running applications in Kubernetes or maybe outside of Kubernetes, um, and we can see how they behave, what kind of operations they're using, uh, 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 what are their interactions with the Linux kernel? Uh, and using this information, we can start to fine tune uh, the definitions of our applications. And the way we are doing it, in, in my example, and uh, what I'm going to show you today is actually is not a product, it is more of a research we are doing in order to do some product, is uh, a way to do uh, to detect the, these behaviors, and we started with by using Inspector Gadget, which we have the representatives of the projects are here sitting here among us. Uh, it's an awesome project, and it enables us to make eBPF observability very simple, very very easy to to use. Uh, I suggest you looking into the, uh, uh, to this project. The way it works, it, it installs Node agents on Kubernetes nodes and streams out different data streams, file access, network connections, process information, capabilities, system calls, all the informations are getting back to us users. 
Now, after a while, we started to work with it, and then we got to a conclusion that right now what fits us better is a little bit different approach. What we did is we took Inspector Gadget, built upon it a, 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 an implementation of how to turn these eBPF informations and data streams into uh, Kubernetes uh, custom resources. And we created this application profiler for Kubescape, uh, Kubescape App Profiler, which is a, a, a lab project for us. And what it does, it wraps around the inspector gadget and, and takes this information uh, from all these pods which starting on the Kubernetes nodes and turn them into these objects uh, we can easily consume by, uh, by our scripting. Now the way you can install the Kepler filer is really simple. It's just to apply, apply uh, 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 with kubectl and it starts uh, uh, to run on your, on your nodes and it starts to create these CRDs uh, uh, which, are lo which look like this. And I'm sorry that it's like it's super small. I'm not sure that you're seeing that right now. But the general idea that you have this application profile object which contains uh, different, these different aspects of the workload, uh, capabilities it uses, the DNS request it does, the, uh, the process it runs, and like if we have more screens here below, you would see the rest. Uh, uh, but in general, the idea is that you see all these, uh, uh, all these data streams uh, aggregated into one object. It was very, very useful for us because um, we use Kubescape and again, full disclosure, I am one of the maintainers of Kubescape. Uh, uh, we took, uh, took the Kubescape scans as objects and it was very easy for us to tell, uh, take the application profiles as objects, taking these two data streams objects together, merge them uh, together and get ma make more sense of the results. So to show you uh, uh, what we, uh, um, what kind of things we've been playing with and start to work on it is these are on these main security issues around workloads. What kind of kernel privileges the workloads are using? What kind of file access the workloads have? Uh, whether they are talking to Kubernetes API. And there is an inherent importance in, in securing and tying down the workloads to have use actually those privileges which are actually in use. So you don't want every workload to have Kubernetes API access. What, uh, what does it mean? That you don't want to uh, uh, automatically everyone have an access, to uh, access token for, uh, um, so, sorry, service account token uh, for the Kubernetes API because if an attacker is able to uh, penetrate the workload, it automatically has access to the Kubernetes API regardless whether this workload is intended, was intended to talk to the Kubernetes API from the beginning. So I'm taking this example uh, as the first one. And I'm running Kubescape uh, scan, which essentially what it does, it lists out all the uh, uh, workloads in my Kubernetes cluster, which have uh, access to, uh, to the Kubernetes API through the service account token. Uh, in my case, uh, I took the, uh, took the screenshots over the first one. Uh, I've used the microservices, uh, the Google microservices uh, demo application. It has a deployment called payment service. The payment service has an, uh, a problem that it has an automatic mapping of service account. And the question is what I'm doing with this information. I'm like, I have a cluster. I'm managing not the one cluster, but multiple clusters with multiple applications. And I get an, uh, such an error. How do I know what should I do now? So the tool says that, okay, you should put, uh, ma make this uh, property false. You should say to Kubernetes not to mount the this, uh, this service account token. But we don't know if the application uses that or not. Now, what can we do? We can like start to make phone calls, or sorry, no one does phone calls today, but we start to write Slacks and Discords and, and open up GitHub issues. And what we see is uh, after a while, we get information and we said, okay, safely we can turn this off because this application doesn't use it. Or someone will say that it uses that, then we have to leave it as is. But what we said that if we're looking, taking these application profiles, and remember I told you that the application profile has the information what kind of files were opened inside the container, right? And if I'm looking 
and this is the, the uh, this listing within uh, the application profile of uh, uh, of the files that were open. If I'm doing this very very simple grep over the application profile, whether the var run secrets Kubernetes IO service account was opened. Uh, in the first case, I don't find any access. In the second, I do find, you see one here, uh, I do find access. These are two different application profiles. One is touching, uh, 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 one is touching the, uh, the service account token, the second is not. This means that I can use the eBPF information, the observability information, to turn, safely turn this on and make a decision above this security issue, right? So, again, I'm, I'm reiterating the idea. The idea is like trying to make sense, using eBPF, trying to make sense of all of these problems and, and, and trying to sort out really fast. Obviously, you can do it the hard way, again, reminding you Slack, Discord. But the time we invest in these kind of things uh, is like enormous and most of the time we are just not, not do, attacking these problems because we don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Another example here is, uh, 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 is another, another control, another control which is telling us whether a uh, uh, workload has uh, a mount from the host within uh, Kubernetes. It, this is obviously uh, uh, have multiple issues with mounting uh, uh, host uh, uh, directories into a workload. Sometimes for some, different, some applications you must have, mostly administra uh, administrative like applications must have this uh, thing, but most normal applications, usually there is no reason to do that. And again, Cubescape scans, it puts out actually the, uh, the profiler uh, uh, workload which we're running. It says you have like multiple host path mounts, which is not a good thing. What can we do? We can again, Last, list out what, what are the files which were touched by the workload. And, and again, trying to grab it out manually in, in this case. Uh, uh, trying to see what, whether these host paths are indeed touched by the, uh, uh, by the application. Um, if they are touched, then you have to ignore this issue. You have to create an exception, say, well, this is a must. This is how the application works. I can't do anything about it, and it's okay. But if there, it is not touching, then you can lower your attack, uh, like uh, uh, decrease your attack surface uh, in a very easy way. And it is, again, it is very, very important. Now, the third example is uh, we are leaving the realm of, of, of files. Um, we are going into the examples of uh, uh, Linux kernel privileges inside the workload. So another Kubescape control tells you, lists out which, which uh, workloads have insecure capabilities, like which are the very, very pro, uh, capabilities which are giving huge privileges to the workload. Again, which can be, uh, uh, if an attacker is getting to the execution contact, uh, can use it to elevate its privileges beyond, uh, uh, beyond what should be. Now, again, we are exiting with some ideas of what the problem is. And Inspector Gadgets is a way to, uh, to give us information about what kind of capabilities are in actually used during the runtime. And therefore, the couple file logs it into the object. And, uh, um, and then we can list it out what, which uh, uh, capabilities were actually used during the runtime of the workload. And again, take this information into, uh, in, into a place where we can make sense of, of, of the control failures. This is something that, uh, uh, that is, to be honest, we found problems with this, uh, and we have to sort out uh, uh, those problems. But in general, it is, again, very, very important to use the least privileges uh, uh, approach in this kind because uh, because uh, cap these capabilities can give a huge, uh, uh, huge uh, um, advance, uh, advantage to, to, uh, to an attacker. So um, I think that we are stopping here with the screenshots. Uh, we're, we're going to go over, um, I just don't want to repeat myself. I think that the, the, the idea was clear. I think that, again, um, the, 
general idea is that we are trying to merge different data streams in order to, to make, uh, make our life much better. And, uh, um, and to see that it, in, in actually we've, um, we've played around with, this, with our own components at Armo in our production environment just to see how it sorts out. And, and it, like, it was amazing. Like within a day, we're like being able to just playing around with this kind of stuff lower our, 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 uh, our control failures by, I think, 80%. Uh, and it was just amazing. Now, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to turn this idea into, into actually a product. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll add them to our, uh, to our offering. So it means that all these, currently all these issues you can see and you've seen before, uh, uh, can be covered using these data streams. So all these kind of uh, control failures like all privilege escalation, read-only uh, root file system, automatic mapping is, uh, of service account tokens we just, just seen, and all the others can be covered using, uh, using these data streams and can be automatized and uh, uh, can be made very, very safe to implement. Now, another two things we, which we used uh, and for this, we use directly Inspector Gadget. Um, we moved to, uh, to full uh, network micro-segmentation in our production system. And we did that with follow, uh, simply using Inspector Gadget advice uh, feature, uh, which is uh, tracking the network activity on, uh, on the Kubernetes nodes. And it com uh, compares it with, with uh, uh, the actual pod behavior. Um, pod names and the pod IPs. Therefore, we can generate Kubernetes native network policies. Um, and uh, it just worked uh, really good. There are like a few caveats. For example, uh, you know, going to where our backend is going to GitHub. And uh, the GitHub endpoint is, is obviously a problematic thing because, uh, you know, we'll hit different IPs over the time. Uh, because they're using IP range, so this was something we needed to correct uh, manually. Um, and obviously, we had also AWS endpoints we were hitting, which had uh, some uh, the same problem. Uh, but in general, from the pot-to-pot uh, -pot communication perspective, this is uh, this worked for us very nicely. Um, the second thing. Yeah, and sorry, just uh, uh, I forget. I wanted to show you also that installing Inspector Gadget is super easy uh, on your cluster. Like if you have crew, it's literally you know two commands uh, uh, rolling out the Inspector Gadget, um, and and I think it's it's something worth trying to play with and, and see how it works. Um, the way you know generally you generate network policies with Inspector Gadget is is twofold. One is that, that you are recording the actual network events, um, and after you've recorded the network events, you are like tr uh, uh, translating the network events into actual Kubernetes native network policy. My only uh, um, my only concern with this approach that that we were um, we were actually monitoring our production system, for example, for a day. And some of the pods already left uh, the cluster by the time we generated the network policy, so their IPs weren't resolved to uh, to pods, um, pod names, and it was something we needed to do manually afterwards. Um, I think we've covered here everything. Uh, yeah, um, I think the other. Uh, Thing that would be really nice is to have support, and we heard it from a few uh, people that uh, there needs to be support for other kind of network policies, not just Kubernetes native network policies. So Cilium, Calico, and stuff like that should also be entered to, to make it more more usable. Uh, actually, I, as I see, like most of the people are not, not using Kubernetes native network policies, but using more advanced uh, uh, policies than that. Uh, the second thing we did for uh, our, our production lockdown was actually attaching uh, second policies for our, uh, uh, for our uh, public facing workloads. Uh, again, we used uh, the inspector gadget advice uh, uh, 
capabilities for that. Um, just a quick like test here. Um, can you, anyone raise hands here who knows what the second policy is? Yes, you don't count. Uh, so, just a, in two words. Uh, uh, um, second policy is a way to limit uh, 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 processes in Linux of making system calls. You can co uh, configure the second, which is a Linux kernel facility, to block different system calls. And the idea when, uh, I don't know, historically I might be wrong, but when Docker defined the, the, run, uh, the basic feature set, I think it defined uh, uh, that second policies can be attached to containerized uh, processes, and uh, uh, and you can give it a, a list of of uh, of system calls that you allow to uh, a container to do. It is a super, it is an awesome protection, a way to protect your workloads. When a pro, uh, workload is uh, uh, is limited in the system calls to things that he actually can uh, system calls that it must have to do, any kind of new process will have a hard time uh, behaving under that rules. And especially if you're looking at most of the exploited kernel uh, uh, issues are usually belonging to system calls which are rarely used. Therefore, usually applications don't need that. And if you're able to, uh, if you remove this capability, attackers have also a hard, hard time to escalate their privileges with, through kernel exploits. So it's an awesome way to protect workloads. The problem is that it's really, really hard to configure. Like any, system, any application developer, if you're asking what, what system calls your application is, is using, usually will look with a, you know, these blank eyes and, and, and won't understand what do you want from him. So the way to use eBPF to understand what system calls uh, an application is doing and turn it to a policy is a really great way uh, to implement such a lockdown. Um, my most problem, most I think among all these uh, challenges I'm, I, I'm seeing here is the most problem I had today is um, the last one. So if the second policy is not like is not permissive enough and you're missing, you missed some kind of system call during the observability period, you will have really hard time understanding what the problem is. Like the application will just have a random failure and, and you won't understand it. It will take a long time to debug it and understand what the problem, especially if it's a third party uh, application. Um, so again, I'm, I'm a big believer of SecComp and really hoping that you know, all the tooling around it is going to be much, much better. Uh, you can see the Kubernetes uh, um, uh, security policies operator. I think it's one of the greatest projects which tries to make second policies as a first class citizen in, in, in Kubernetes. Um, and it, it, it's really a really good thing. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk uh, to you about is another project which we are doing for a year, is using eBPF to improve uh, static uh, image vulnerability scanners uh, results. So. If you're scan you have scanned images, I don't know how many of you uh, scanned images, I don't want to, uh, again, to raise hands uh, here. But uh, uh, um, so I, I, every one of you seen results of, uh, of image scanners, you can see that there are like, not just tens, but sometimes hundreds of, of vulnerabilities. And I can tell you as someone who's coming from the security realm of the world, uh, I can tell you that in less than one tenth of a percent can be really exploited. It means that a lot, most of them are, are, are false positives. And uh, it's really, really hard to manage them. And, and what we did, again, based on the Inspector Gadget project in Cubescape, is actually we are using the file access information we have on a pod to see what files were opened, used during the pod's runtime, and see, take the SBOM of the image, see what of the software packages were open during the runtime of the, uh, uh, of the workload uh, and mark them as in use or, or, or reachable uh, and, fill, and filter out all those who are not. And if we feed the, this filtered SBOM into the vulnerability scanner, uh, we, have, we have less than, I can, like it depends, really depends on, on, on the image, but 
of Tundis, we have 80% is filtered out. And, and it's, uh, it's magic, like, and it's in the grasp, grasp of our hands. So it's, it's just something that really helps all those people who are actually day to day, what they're doing is they're, they're working with vulnerabilities and trying to uh, uh, fix them one by one and see, evaluate them, okay, whether this needs a fix or we can live with that and so on. And if you can say that, that only 20% of those vulnerabilities have to, they have to deal with, it's already a, a, um, it's already a huge step. Um, it's a little bit promo time. I'm going to give a talk about vulnerability scan result prioritization in KubeCon. So if you're interested, uh, you're welcome to join. So this was my talk for today. I hope it wasn't too fast. I, I, it felt like really fast. I uh, hope it made sense. Uh, any questions? I would... Thank you, Ben. You weren't too fast. You were bang on time. Yeah, I tried to. Right, questions. Yeah, th thanks for the talk. It's a kind of a side question related to eBPF. Uh, there is a lot of new tooling using eBPF. So how much can that impact the server, the workloads, having like your, your system, but many others all using eBPF at the same time for observability metrology, observability security, observability this and that, yeah. and, and maybe s like service mesh and network yeah. stack? So. So I, like, talking about the effect on, of, of eBPF on, on our CPU load is, is like, it's such a broad question. And, and I will try to, like, really, uh, 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 like, take it to part. Everyone knows, and Liz can you know, comment on that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, um, like, I, I feel bad answering this question. <laughs> You're in, in your presence. Uh, uh, um, so... Uh, so there are things that eBPF showed that it can improve the, uh, the performance of applications like network routing. There is like no question about that. And, and there are multiple reasons for that. And everyone who, who, who bought, uh, built in his life network step in Linux understands that what, uh, what is the problem. You can see different uh, uh, detection tools um, I don't know, if, like for example, Falco, okay, which are there to detect runtime issues, uh, attacks. You can see that they are eating up your CPU like hell. And I, t and I tell you something, it is not eBPF who's eating up. It is the design uh, uh, of how Falco was, uh, the whole design of Falco was built that all the data is streamed for eBPF. And there is a rule engine which like, like eats up CPU in the user space like very much. So it's not the eBPF part actually that it's it, it's very uh, uh, you know very uh, CPU intensive, but the, as a result, the user space part. But I can tell you that obviously if you have high volume events from eBPF, any kind, either for like the application profile or inspector gadget, and you will attach to it something that it is triggered by these events, it has to like send over the network of them, or I don't know, it will have an a very performance effect because there might be a lot of uh, eBPF events. So I hope. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Any more questions? No? Okay then, another big round of applause for Ben. Thank you very much.